There is some evidence from um, the uh, Avon uh, study that was carried out in the UK, and it's a longitudinal study where they uh, recruited women who were pregnant and they follow them through until their kids are, I think, school-aged. And there's evidence that moms who are anxious and depressed during pregnancy are more likely to have kids with behavioral sleep problems at one or two years of age. So there is that association. But um, we are controlling for, uh, in, in the study that I did, the pilot study, depression was an exclusion. Reed and colleagues found in two and three-year-olds from the Canadian Longitudinal Study, so that's our big longitudinal database and they had 3,000 kids in that study that child sleep problems accounted for a small but significant independent proportion of children's scores for internalizing and externalizing behavior independent of commonly identified risk factors and I won't go into the long list of risk factors but they concluded that these sleep problems um, exacerbate emotional and behavioral problems. Does everybody know what internalizing and externalizing behaviors are? What's internalizing behaviors? Yeah, withdrawn, anxious, depressed, and externalizing is aggressive, um, disruptive. disruptive, yeah, hyperactive, yeah. So, so that's the effects on kids. And then if we look at the effects on parents, um, I've already um, talked about the, the pilot study we did preparatory to doing the RCT, which showed that parents um, improved their mood, their sleep quality and their fatigue levels after an intervention for child sleep problems. And it wasn't just maternal mood that improved, it was paternal mood too, because we insisted that both parents get involved in that intervention. And so we measured all these things for the fathers. And their fatigue also improved significantly, and so did their sleep quality. Now I just reviewed a study from Australia, a dissertation that I was sent, I'm the, one of the external reviewers on it. And this was a guy who was looking at paternal sleep and fatigue in dads with six-week and 12-week-old infants. So obviously a different age range, but what he showed, he was interested in, is does it make them unsafe at work if they're going to work fatigued? And what he showed was they reported far more near-miss accidents on the road, and they reported more safety incidents at work that required medical intervention and more near-miss events at work. So that's for fathers who are sleep deprived at six and 12 weeks uh, post birth. You can imagine how sleep deprived they are if this has been going on for the baby's first year of life. And even though mothers often try and protect fathers from sleep deprivation by being the ones that get up with the babies, if they're all sleeping in the same room, that the dad's sleep is going to be disrupted just as much as the mom's sleep is. And then they're going to work the next day and potentially at higher risk. And the mothers um, with six, three to six month olds with sleep problems are reporting poor mental and physical health, not just mental health. And also they report more parental disagreement about managing infant and be child behavior. So if you, if you get overtired, stressed, depressed parents coming out of the first year of infancy and they're not problem solving very well, they're not going to have an easy time pulling together as a team to, to figure out how to deal with behavior that starts to sh change and shift as children get into the toddler years. And there's the potential for a lot more parental disagreement happening around that. And persisting child sleep problems at two to three years of age, this is a study in Australia where it was a randomized control trial and they followed up all the kids in the trial when they were two to three years old and they looked to see who still had sleep problems at that point, regardless of whether they were in the intervention or control group. And the ones who had still had sleep problems had moms who were depressed. They reported limitations to daily functioning and they reported that their partners undermined their parenting. So it has impact on parents, yeah. There is some evidence from um, the uh, Avon uh, study that was carried out in the UK, and it's a longitudinal study where they uh, recruited women who were pregnant, and they follow them through until their kids are, I think, school-aged. And there's evidence that moms who are anxious and depressed during pregnancy are more likely to have kids with behavioral sleep problems at one or two years of age. So there is that association. But... Um, we are controlling for, 
in, in the study that I did, the pilot study, depression was an exclusion criteria. So if people had a previous diagnosis of, uh, diagnosis of depression, they couldn't enroll in the study because depression was one of our outcome variables. And equally for the Rocky Sleep study that we're doing in Vancouver right now, depression is an exclusion criteria, which is making the mothers that call the study very upset because there's a lot of moms out there who are depressed who have infants with sleep problems. But what we showed in the pilot study was that parental mood increased significantly and the effect size was huge. It was like 1.2 or something. And that was in a, a sample size of 40 people. You don't get effect sizes like that normally unless you've got a huge sample size. So what that's telling us is if, if the depression preceded the sleep problem, it is unlikely that solving the sleep problem would improve the depression. And that's not what we're finding. We're finding it does improve the depression. So I don't know. You can't unravel it in every single case. But regardless of whether the sleep problem precedes the depression or the depression precedes the sleep problem, having an infant that wakes on a regular basis and adds to your fatigue levels is not going to help you resolve your depression. If we had 105 children dying, during pregnancy or during the intrapartum period in this province, there would be an outcry that you would not believe. And we would be looking at changing all the practices that we have in the antenatal and intrapartum period. The fact that we can have that level of death over a th three to four year period and have no attention paid to it shows how little attention gets paid to what goes on after parents take their kids home from the hospital and to what potential risk factors are operating in children's and parents' lives. And one of the things that the people from the coroner's office said to me when we were talking about the report is they think that in, in some circumstances it may be parental exhaustion that's partly occurring here, where the parents are absolutely exhausted and they've pulled the kids into bed for a co-sleeping or co-bedding arrangement and they're so exhausted that they, they, won't, they don't respond as they might normally to signals that something could be wrong. So, so what are we doing here? We're, we're ignoring this as a, as a public health problem. Parents can help children sleep better and improve their outcomes. It's, it's very manageable. And this rocky sleep study is not rocket science. It is presenting parents with a package that they can use and some support they can use. And what we're doing in the Rocky Sleep Study is we're training public health nurses to deliver the intervention. And we're training public health nurses to deliver the intervention because we think that's where it should be situated. I have no desire to be a sleep guru for British Columbia. And we don't have any systematic interventions in this province right now for parents with kids with sleep problems. If they try and go to their family doctor or a pediatrician, a lot of them don't know any more about sleep than the parents do. It's not part of their curriculum in medical school. And it depends on the public health nurses they approach, whether the public health nurses are interested in sleep as a problem and have done some research on it and are well informed about it or whether they're not. And a lot of them turn to sleep consultants and they charge between five and six hundred dollars to see a family to help them with an infant sleep problem. And a lot of families cannot afford five or six hundred dollars to deal with a sleep problem. And there's no guarantees that that's going to work. That's what you get charged for the package. So it is a public health issue. We can help parents to improve children's sleep and improve their outcomes. They are amenable to interventions. There's been no research over the last 25 years that's shown that any of these behavioral approaches have had any negative effects on the children in terms of their attachment or their emotional development or their well-being psychologically. Absolutely no evidence for that. And there are interventions that are well supported. The problem is we've never tested them in Canada. We have a dearth of interventions here in Canada, which is why I'm doing this project, because we need some tr evidence from a randomized controlled trial to try and get some of the health authorities to change their approaches to dealing with infant health problems. And as we all know, randomized controlled trials are considered the gold standard for evidence. So even though we, s we had good outcomes in our pilot study, that's not good enough because we didn't have a control group and we couldn't show that those changes wouldn't have happened over time without the interventions that we used. <laughs>